Hey, Team Healthy. I'm so pleased to be with you once again today. And, you know, I've, I've been putting a lot of emphasis on trying to figure out this whole subject of covert narcissism. And I'm telling you, I've got the guy that can talk to us, um, you know, left and right about this, and we could go on and on about this. We have a special guest here today, Dr. George Simon. He's a, a retired therapist, psychologist from Little Rock, Arkansas. And we have mutual acquaintances and all that have been there through the years. Dr. Simon wrote a book a number of years ago that has the best title. Uh, that, I mean, just right up front, it, it speaks a lot. It's called In Sheep's Clothing. All right, just pause right there. What, what connotation does that have? And then the, the subtitle is Understanding and Dealing with Manipulative People. It's uh, it, it sold hugely uh, throughout the years. It's uh, It's been translated into over 30 languages. And uh, Dr. Simon is, uh, is well known in the field of psychology, uh, many uh, consultations, workshops, seminars, in addition to having had his, uh, his private practice before he was uh, they became retired. So Dr. Simon, we're so pleased to have you. Thank you for being on the, on the broadcast with us here today. Well, thank you, doctor. I am pre pleased to be with you. Okay. And, and now tell me now are, you're, you're also still active. Uh, do, are you, do you still have the blog psych, uh, psychology philosophy in real life? Is that one of your, uh, well, that is one of the blogs I used to write for. Okay. And there's still articles on that blog, but uh, I have my own uh, blog site at drgeorgesimon.com. That's okay. D-R-G-E-O-R-G-E-S-I-M-O-N.com. Okay. And uh, I put up weekly podcasts on on YouTube, as well as my weekly blog posts on the blog at drgeorgesimon.com. Okay. Well, and we'll make sure for our audience that we uh, we have notations of that when we get it all up. So uh, thanks there. And please, uh, those of you who are listening, uh, make yourself familiar with, with Dr. Simon. Okay. I want to get into this, uh, this whole topic of uh, narcissism in sheep's clothing and all. But before we do, let, let me just ask something that I, I always find fascinating. And that is, how did you get into this particular angle where you're looking at people with character disorders and specifically narcissism? Uh, what, what's the history on that? Uh, that's the most commonly asked question. Okay, there are three re reasons fundamentally. For, for decades now, we've been in a, in a very different age. Uh, most of our traditional psychology paradigms came out of the Victorian era when people were literally making themselves sick uh, as a result of overactive consciences and pathological levels of unreasonable guilt and shame. Uh, but when's the last time that you treated someone who couldn't walk because of some uh, unreasonable fear or anxiety or a pathological level of guilt or shame, or somebody who had lost their eyesight because they couldn't bear to see something about themselves or their history that they just couldn't bear to, to uh, witness anymore. These kinds of things happened in the Victorian era, and they, they never happened very often, but they did happen. And all of our major paradigms came out of that era. Well, uh, as I like to say in the workshops, uh, these days, unfortunately, the problems that we have are not because people are overly hung up, as we children of the 60s used to say, but primarily because some people aren't quite hung up enough about okay. the things that they let themselves do. So what happened was I realized the ball game has changed. The people who were coming to see me were not hysterically blind or paralyzed. Um, and they needed much more than I was trained to offer them. So I had to kind of reinvent the wheel, so to speak. So that was go back one. and do all the study and uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, th that was number one. Number two, I was seeing two different kinds of people in my office. I was seeing relationship partners uh, of character impaired people, narcissists, covert aggressives, as I call them, mm -hmm. uh, uh, other character impaired personalities. I was seeing their relationship partners who were such who were suffering from what we commonly call now the gaslighting effect. In their gut, they knew something was not quite right, but their relationship partner had them convinced that they were seeing it all wrong, that they just didn't get it, that it was all their fault. 
Yeah. And they were just kind of a mess because of this. And then I was also seeing the character impaired relationship partners. And I realized that the kind of intervention, the, uh, that the person on the receiving end of all this character dysfunction, the kind of intervention they required was very, very different from the yeah. kind of intervention uh, that their spouse or their relationship partner needed. So once again, I had to go back to the drawing board. You know, I, I, when I was in my practice, I, I found myself feeling very conflicted once I started figuring things out. And, and like you say, you had the narcissistic individual and the one that, that has the covert aggression is how you just described it. And that's so accurate. Um, then the person who's on the receiving end of that, it's like, OK, we have two very, very different angles that we need to be looking at here and to try to come up with marital therapy in a um, combination where with a mix like that, it's like, wow, that's, that's super difficult. And, uh, and so uh, one of the things I started doing more and more is I started breaking it off and, and working with the one who honestly wanted to be there and, and could do something with it. Now, my, my angle is uh, you need to individualize your efforts. And hopefully as you're engaging with other individuals, whether it's your spouse or your extended family or friends or whoever, uh, that they'll, uh, other individuals will be able to appreciate what you're trying to do and coordinate with you. Well, what you're saying there, Dr. Carter, is so important because the number one comment that I get uh, from readers on the blog is that they experienced this type of therapy-induced trauma when they went for help. Maybe they finally got enough leverage to drag their relationship partner in for a marital session. And then the person was so good at impression management, as we call it, so good at uh, at, at uh, uh, various manipulation tactics, that, and maybe their perspective was such that they always had to see everybody else as having an equal role in yeah. the creation of difficulties. Well, they ended up feeling worse for the effort to try and get some help. Uh, maybe even the therapist got bamboozled because they weren't sufficiently trained in how to uh, assess and properly deal with character impaired personalities. So this is a, a very common uh, comp uh, comment that I get. And I also realized that when you're dealing with the relationship partner who's been on the receiving end of all this covert behavior and all this narcissistic behavior, giving them the support they need, helping them reclaim some sense of personal dignity and move on in their life, that work is relatively speaking easy <laughs> for a therapist. Yeah. You know, providing that you. support, providing that ear, you know. Now, dealing with the character impaired party, so, so many variables are there. And of course, the common consensus, it's erroneous, but the common consensus is they can't be helped. Here's the bigger problem. We don't know how to help. <laughs> okay. We don't. None of our parrot, none of our traditional paradigms were meant for the problem. And naturally, they don't help. They were yeah. never meant to deal with the issue. They yeah. weren't designed for that. Once I got that through my thick little skull, mm -hmm. it became a lot easier. So that when the motivation is right, when the time is right, and you don't have any control over that. But I have to tell you, I have a very full consultation schedule all over the world with people in their 50s and 60s who write me and say, you know what? I'm finally at that point. I realize I've made a mess of my whole life. Now what the heck do I do? How, how do I grow? Uh, I realize yeah. I've been stunted in my character growth. I've I've lied and I've cheated. I've hurt people. I've made a mess of my life, my career. Now what do I do? So when the time is right and the motivation is right, help is available if you know what to do. And I will tell you, none of the things that I was trained to do are the thing to do. <laughs> I got you. you that. <laughs> well, uh, I, I want to pick up on your uh, your title in sheep's clothing. Um, one of the things that I know is that narcissists want you to assume that they're just as normal as anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that and that's part of their shtick, if you will. Right. Um, and, and it's also part of the gaslighting. But then it's only after time that you realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm being played here. Um, 
What what kind of common experiences have you seen in your uh, many years where that dynamic tends to play out? Boy, <laughs> you ask a really good question there. It, you know, it plays out actually with all character disturbances. And narcissism, you know, it wasn't very long ago, if you'll recall, that the official um, uh, diagnostic manual of the uh, American Psychological Association, the Committee on Personality Disorders, actually was seriously considering eliminating the category I, I know of narcissistic that. personality disorder and an uproar developed because anybody who's encountered a narcissist knows that they're very real. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The problem was and the problem continues to be the way we define and categorize these things. Okay. Um, and narcissism is a dimension of character uh, that varies as to type and degree. There are, uh, when I wrote my second book, Character Disturbance, I explained that I had been seeing in my practice two very, very different groups of narcissists the more traditionally thought of compensatory type that underneath it all didn't have a, a solid sense of self-worth and was cr chronically trying to prove themselves, um, uh, uh, presenting a facade of competence that uh, uh, that masked uh, an inner insecurity and vulnerability. Uh, and then a very different kind of narcissist who really thought, they were all that. We now call them the grandiose type. Right. The, right. the kind that has chronically overestimated their worth and their capability, and nobody can tell them anything, and they just know how great they are, and they just know how inferior you are. Yeah. Inferior you are. And everything is fine in the relationship when you have your place. You know, when you know your place and you do the bidding and you let me run the show. When you play your assigned role. Yes. Uh, everything is fine. But, but the minute you step out of line, oh, my goodness, there's trouble. Yeah. And there are so many different variations of narcissism. And, and one of the things, and I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. One of the things that we know is that it's a pattern on a spectrum. Right. Uh, each one of us can have some moments where, you know, when we talk about narcissism, we talk about being controlling or having low empathy or manipulative, well, and selfish. Well, uh, if I have to be honest, if you have to be honest, there are moments when it's like, oh, I, I kind of fell into that myself. Healthy individuals see it, though. Right. They acknowledge it. They uh, uh, recognize the propensity toward that, and they put up safeguards to do something about it. They have insight and awareness. Uh, unhealthy people don't. So what, what okay. was your thinking on all All that? right. So this is where my thinking differs from most of my peers. Okay. And boy, do I drill this into workshop attendees when I have the chance. It's not that they don't see Okay. Okay. They, <laughs> I'm listening. It's that they see, but in their heart, they still vehemently disagree. Okay. All right. There isn't a thing you can tell them they haven't heard 10,000 times before. There isn't an issue you can't bring to them that they don't understand fully what it is you want them to do differently. They just don't have a heart to do it. And okay. there's a difference between not seeing and disagreeing. And this is why, this is why so many people experience therapy-induced trauma, because relationship partners and therapists in general make the same mistake over and over again. They waste time, breath, and energy trying to get people who already see but disagree to see. And they live under the delusion that if I put this to this person in just such a poetically beautiful way, they will finally say, oh, my goodness, I never realized that before. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> this is craziness. Talk, yeah. talk about crazy. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you communicate so well on that. Okay, so one of the biggest questions that I'm asked is, do narcissists know they're narcissists? Do they, do they understand on a conscious level uh, how inappropriate they are or uh, how problematic they can become to other individuals? 
Okay, once again, that's on a spectrum. And I have another little rhyming phrase, uh, you know, that kind of goes along with they see but disagree. It's not a matter of how aware. It's a matter of the care. They, it is... They they know how they operate, and the, one of the reasons why the way they operate is resistant to modification is because they like the way they operate. I don't care. Okay? It works in, for me. In, in fancy uh, psychological speak, we call this egocentonia. It means it's comfortable with the image I like to have of myself. I think it's working for me just fine. Thank you very much. Why should I change it? And we see magne we see malignant narcissists on the world and national stage right now, daring to say that out loud. You know, we we even yeah. had somebody who said, "I know what people say about my personality, but you know what? <laughs> hey, so what? I'm okay? okay. I'm good." So it's not a matter of awareness; it's a matter of having the care, the level of empathy the level of concern about anything bigger than their own sweet self to do anything about it. Yeah. And that's a matter of the heart. And if, if, if more therapists would pay more attention to what goes on transactionally in that uh, mode, in the heart to heart mode, they would start to witness some very different things transpire in a therapy session. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you can make anybody ready to make a change, but you don't have to waste any time with awareness because that's not the issue. Okay. Um, the, uh, um, the, the question is, uh, at that point then, if you're engaging with someone, listening to what you just said, uh, they have a certain awareness. They just don't care about making any kind of adjustment. Is, is there any hope then if you're maybe, connected yeah. with that? Maybe, not, maybe not then, maybe not then, but you know, uh, sometimes, sometimes it's worth, you, you know, in therapy with character impaired people, it's all about the leverage. So, uh, to, to put it simply, many times narcissists or the various aggressive personalities come in actually to fight with you. Um, <laughs> yes. And what, mat what matters is, is how you conduct yourself in the fight. Sometimes with the most malignant narcissists, all I have to do is be unbudgeable. I, I, I actually go through vignettes in my training uh, workshops. I show therapists exactly how it works because they're determined to have you see things just like they do, yeah. you know, because they've got it right. And after you, after all, you've got it wrong too, just like and everybody they, else. And they, they love it when right? they get a rise out of you too, don't they? Exactly. So many times the, the, the best intervention is simply not moving not allowing the steamroller to roll over. Um, it really frustrates. And it's the beginning. It's the beginning of some potential movement. You know, there are principles that go way beyond me and my importance. And when I stand on those in the encounter, when I do just what the aggrieved and tired and worn out relationship partner, uh, when I do just the opposite of when they capitulate <laughs> and I hold ground because I'm clinging to those values and those principles, eventually, eventually they get a little frustrated with mm -hmm. what they're trying to do with all the manipulations they're trying to use. And they'll either do one of, they'll do one of two things. They'll either go away mm -hmm. and not come back and find a new source time, or they'll come back for another round. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Both. Which is better than just going away. <laughs> you know, as, as I'm listening to you, I, I mean, I could not agree with you more. It, it takes a real strength to be able to pull off what you just said. And therein lies the problem with so many people. Um, one of the things I say is a, a goal that narcissists would have is to uh, suck you dry of who you are and then fill you with themselves. Right. And uh, uh, they they want to have that kind of uh, control. They, they can be very authoritarian, black and white and all of that. So I guess the question is, um, 
if you can see the need to do what you just described about having that firmness and that uh, resoluteness without having to get uh, pulled into all of the unnecessary arguing and haranguing, what does it take to get to that place? Oh, my goodness. Well, one thing it took, and you mentioned this earlier, uh, very wise words that you mentioned earlier, and that is a lot of these characteristics that cluster on a spectrum with the character impaired among us, a lot of these characteristics are features that we have all experienced in our personalities at one point or another. And so one thing I had to come to grips with was my own arrogance of thinking that I had been educated well enough to know what the heck I'm doing in this encounter. And by God, if it wasn't working, it must be their fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm tracking with you, doctor. Yeah. You know, when I finally entertained the notion, you know what? Maybe this way of trying to approach this person and these issues, maybe this way is flawed. Maybe this perspective has some weaknesses. Maybe I need to change my approach. And having that humility changed everything. Yes. I promise you it changed everything. A, a term that I uh, have grown very fond of is radical acceptance. Um, and by that, I mean there, there are times when you come to terms with what's in front of you. And if it's ugly, if it's uh, not what you want, bottom line is there it is. And so then in my own humility, just as you're saying, I have to ask, well, am I able to accept, which is not the same as condoning, can I accept what's in front of me so that I can then move on and be the best version of me that I'm capable of being? That, right. That's what I'm hearing you suggest. Yes. And, you know, there again is some very uh, priceless wisdom because years ago, some researchers doing the one of those long retrospective studies about what makes the difference between health and ill health in adult people based on their childhood rearing experiences and radical exception for the radical acceptance of the person they are combined with only conditional acceptance of behavior that okay. they exhibit is the ticket. Okay. It's the ticket. In other words, there have to be principles. You know, in traditional therapy, we accept everything. There is no judgment. Well, you can't do that when you're dealing with, the pe <laughs> with oh, people yeah, I who are running roughshod on, on yes. you and violating every boundary. You can't do that. There's got to be some standards, got to be some limits, got to be some principles. So I meet you where you are without any ill will. Okay. But not everything is okay. And you know what? Maybe I can encourage you right here. Uh, one of the mantras I give in my workshops is, if there's any change, it's going to happen right here, right now. And it doesn't have to be big. You start small. So, you know, the rules in my session are, you know, let's try this. I, I, I can kind of see what we're trying to do here. Would you be willing to try this? Okay. And if you are, if you show any willingness at all to move, to budge even just a little bit, I'm going to reinforce the heck out of it. Okay, It's it's not demeaning, but it's kind of like raising an adolescent, <laughs> uh, you well, know? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like Well, that. in fact, uh, uh, many people in, in our profession would say that narcissists uh, suffer from, uh, from developmental um yeah, uh, character developmental delay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm having yes. a senior moment here, uh, but exactly where they uh, they 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 haven't grown. So okay, let's go into that space. Is there something that we can see in a in that person's background that leads them to that place where they just they they know what they are, but they just don't care? I mean, how hmm. does it get that way? Yeah, you know what? Sometimes that's true. Sometimes, you know, our old debate about is it nature or is it nurture, right. our old debate about that is such a false debate. Uh, there's a little of this sometimes and a little of that. And more importantly, as I say in the workshops, 
there's a dynamic interaction between a natural predisposition you might have and the environment in your in which you're raised. So for example, in a family where there are two children and one naturally tends to be more anxious and more retreating in the face of conflict and more timid and more socially shy, and the other one tends to be more forward, more assertive, uh, more feisty, uh, more prone to fight in the face of conflict, you give them the same environment, their personalities are going to shape up very, very differently over yes. time. So, my major point is that, yes, sometimes uh, a person's history has a lot to do with it. Sometimes a lot of the way they're just naturally wired, especially with empathy deficits, has a lot to do with it. But you know what? It matters not. If change is going to happen, it's going to happen here and now, and it's going to happen the same way all change happens. The way we learn is you try something new and you reinforce it. And you reinforce baby steps. And okay. slowly but surely, you knew, you learn a new way. Uh, and what I'm hearing is uh, the only time that I have to work with is my today. Right. Okay. I hear now. Let, let me ask you this now. Uh, one of the things that narcissists, uh, many of them, as you mentioned, particularly the grandiose, uh, they'll say, oh, I've, I've got lots of self-esteem. And mm -hmm. they come across as confident. And, well, and some do. Uh, it means self-assured and all of that. What's the difference between their angle towards that topic versus a healthy appreciation for self-esteem? Okay. Uh, we have always labored under the assumption that it's compensatory when they show that bravado, that underneath it all, they're really struggling with a poor self-image. But the fact is that people who chronically, as a coping strategy, chronically overestimate their abilities never get a chance to develop a solid, meaningful, justifiable sense of self. Because they're chronic. The problem is the chronic overestimation, okay. the chronic grandiosity, and that has to be dealt with. You know, I know so many, but I'm, I'm not, I shouldn't give any examples. There's so many, there, we have so many um, great displays, you know, the public stage is so, uh, with the media the way it is, we get to see this cavalcade of uh, nefarious characters of all kinds. Yes, on the national Still in stage. the blank. Yes, within the political sphere, within yeah. the within just the the uh, the entertainment world, professional sports, uh, you you name it. Yep. But th there are there are those coaches and owners, uh, say for example of a of a team that know a lot that know a lot. The problem is they don't know quite as much as they think they know. <laughs> Boy, right? is that true? Right? Yeah. And and the more they continue to overestimate, the less of a solid, realistic, justifiable sense of self they're ever going to have a chance to develop. You know, it, it, this seems so um, counterintuitive to, to think this way, but one of the things I tell people is um, you show your strengths by being willing to embrace your own weaknesses. And uh, it's like, yeah, there are times when I, I know this is a flaw of mine or this is something I need to be concentrating on or I didn't handle that very well. Narcissists don't want to do that. It's like, yeah, if, if I have a weakness, it's your fault. And they're, uh, they don't really want to hold on to that. And so healthy self-esteem uh, in its own backwards kind of way uh, means sometimes, you know, when you don't have to esteem yourself. It's like, yep, there's another thing I need to grow on. Sure glad I saw that. And you keep leaning forward and you don't have to have that that all or nothing, black or white sense of um, uh, perfection. Just as you said, they're in constant compensation mode. And it, it's okay to say, yeah, I'm part of humanity just like the, the rest of the 7 billion out there are. Uh, and so to me, there's such a distinction that can be uh, illustrated there. I need to mention that for about uh, 12 seconds, the internet completely winked out on my end. I don't know whether it did on yours. Yeah, well, I just had a little thing that said that uh, you're in, in, you're, uh, uh, it's unstable, but apparently we're okay now. Did, did you okay. catch what I was saying about? No, I didn't. Uh, okay. What, what I was saying is one of the best ways to, uh, to show your strength is to be willing to admit your weakness. 
Yes. And uh, so what, what do you think about that in terms of? Well, how I think that's wonderful, but I think explaining that is a waste of time. The kind of seeing that the character disturbed person needs to have is not this seeing. Okay. It's this seeing. Okay. So what they have to do is experience it. It's kind of like leading a horse to water. <laughs> you just yeah. <laughs> gently, slowly in the here and now, try some different behaviors. You know, the, a person much wiser than myself said, it's a lot more efficacious and it's frankly easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than it is to think your way into a new way of acting. Okay. We, let's, we let's, wait a minute, up. stop on that. You, could you say that again, please? Yes. It's more efficacious. It's more powerful. It lasts longer. It has bigger punch to it. It's more enduring. It's more efficacious, and it's actually easier okay. to act okay. your way into a new way of thinking than it is to think your way into a new way of acting. Okay. We know that the way we think and the way we form our attitudes and the attitudes that we hold and our core beliefs, we know that that affects our way of acting. And what therapists and relationship partners do inevitably is waste time, energy, and breath trying to get people to think differently in right. the hopes that they will act differently when we need to do just the opposite. Okay. Insist on acting differently right here, right now, and you will come to see. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear, too. I mean, I, 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 you're making so much sense. Okay, one last question because we're down on time here boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you're the person who's being impacted by this person uh, that we're describing, uh, what are some of the wise ways to manage your boundaries so that you don't get sucked into their schemes and lose yourself? Gosh. Yeah. Well, you really have to, that's a, that's an art that's developed over time. And I have to admit, I wasn't very good at it. When I first started out, all my buttons got pushed. Oh, and many times. And, uh, and, you know, you, you are so invited many times with folks who know how to push buttons to respond in a very unhealthy, <laughs> very unloving way. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, gosh. You got about three hours for us to talk about this? <laughs> As I say that, I have an entire course <laughs> with 25 videos on how to manage boundaries because there's so many different uh, elements that go into the making of it. So, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but I think one thing to just keep in mind is when in your heart, you know, that it's really much more about them yeah. than about you. It's easier to hold your boundaries and to well, because uh, my thinking on that is a trust your gut. If if you're yeah. sensing something that's just not right, listen to yourself. And then boundaries begins with uh, just having a really solid definition of who you are. Who you and, are. and sticking That's within cool. that. And if the narcissist says, come outside of your definition of you and come over into my definition of who you ought to be, uh, it's like, no, I don't think I need to do that. And then that's where that calm, uh, strong, I, I am where I am uh, mindset comes in that you mentioned a few minutes ago. Yeah, we could do a whole program on how folks who don't have that solid sense of self get really preyed upon by certain types of narcissists yeah. who can turn on the charm, who know how to ego <laughs> massage. We could do a whole program on that. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Team Healthy, we're talking again today with Dr. George Simon out of Little Rock, Arkansas, a fountain of information and insight. I, I'm so honored that you have taken the time out of your busy schedule to be with us, Dr. Simon, and uh, I'd love to hear more from you. Uh, the book, and it's it's been out for quite a while, is uh, is called In Sheep's Clothing, and no matter where in the on the globe you are, uh, it's probably out there in your language. So and there's four others out there too. Okay, yeah, and you have more. Yeah, well, I, I I've been looking. Yeah, there, uh, George, and I know you're all over the internet, and so uh, and rightly so. And so, uh, if you if you're wanting to uh, to gain from the wisdom of somebody that studied this for decades, uh, here's your guy right here, uh, Doctor Simon. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for contributing in the way that you have to the field of psychology and and psychotherapy too. 
Thank you. And same to you. I, I've uh, read and seen a, a few of your uh, works, and I, I know you've been uh, at the forefront of this uh, discovery, shall we say? Yeah. Well, and we all learn from each other, don't we? Yes, we do. And we, we have a little bit of a different angle. It's like, oh, I hadn't thought about that before, but let's go there. Uh, by the way, uh, your your wife is the one that came up with the uh, the title in sheep's clothing. And yeah. I, I need you to pass along a message to her. I, and, uh, and that is, I have a problem with that title. And the problem is, I wish I'd come up with it first. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great title. <laughs> in, in so tell all her that Dr. Carter has a, has a little bit yes, of Yes, in there. all humility, when I tell her uh, how responsible she is for the success of that title, she, she <laughs> says, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's some of the behind the scenes stuff here, isn't it? <laughs> okay, well, Dr. Simon, thank you so much again for being with us. Team Healthy, I, I think you can see why I was excited about having our special guest here. I hope you have a, a good rest of the week, and I'll see you next time then. All right, bye thank now. you. Okay, bye, Dr. Simon.